I'm Matilda Bosley. And I'm Jane Lee. And today we're wondering who screwed millennials out of affordable education? Matilda, have you ever been so angry about something you wanted to, I don't know, light it on fire? I mean, like, yes, I have watched season eight of Game of Thrones, but uh, why do you ask? (laughs) Well... So if you want to have a bad time, be the target of a demonstration and go to Melbourne. This is Bruce. Bruce Chapman. I'm an emeritus professor of economics at the Australian National University. In his lifetime, he's actually run into several people who were that angry. One of my mates was a union leader. And took me around to some of his friends, and they were making effigies to burn. They had an effigy of the Prime Minister, and then they had an effigy of me. And it was really weird because they were very friendly towards me, and they said, It's not personal, you know, this is about the politics. But when I looked at the effigy, I said, Why did it have to make it so ugly? <laughs> I mean, you're going to burn me, can't I at least look pretty? Pretty or not, Bruce's effigy went up in flames. Because? I was involved in the design of what was then called HEXA Higher Education Contribution Scheme. Some have called you the grandfather of HEX. How do you feel about that title? Old. (laughs) (laughs) I used to be the father. Oh no! In a decade or so, if I'm still around, I'll be the great-great-grandfather. Many people were involved in developing HEX and putting it into law, but the initial idea, that was Bruce. Many of the students had signs with my name on it and people saying, kill Chapman, blah, 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 and then they were burning the effigy and my five-year-old said to me, do these people want to hurt you, Daddy? It must have been a bit confronting. It was awful. I thought these people were sending me death threats, maybe one of them... I mean, it only takes 0.001 of 1% of 100,000 people to have a maniac and um, something bad could happen. Spoken like a true economist, Bruce. (laughs) Oh, yeah, I I like the data. I mean, how does that play into when you're thinking about, I guess, student fees? Student fees? Oh, God. It's just like, I just try not to think about it, man. That's, that's a, I'll get to that. I'll burn that bridge when I get to it, basically. And while students may not be burning effigies anymore, when it comes to student fees, things are really bad. It's quite daunting looking at the email saying you owe this, um, like, multiple thousands of dollars. Do you mind if I ask how much will your student debt be by the end of the... Yeah, 78, 60, yeah. 78,000. Not helped by higher than usual inflation growing their hex debts too. Financially speaking, it's uh, more difficult than ever. But at the moment, it's just we're so busy in studying. But when you get a break, you think that you've got this huge amount of hex. Millions of Australians are staring down student loans they'll spend their whole lives paying off. It's just going to keep going up and it's a problem which you're never going to solve, potentially. In fact, it's now making it harder for some graduates to get a home loan. Well, uh, I actually work at the bank for home loan assessments. We don't see as many young people coming through buying houses anymore. It's daunting. It's very daunting. It's almost like having a second mortgage to a house you don't even own. But did it have to be this way? The boomers, shall we say, you know, they went through a time where they didn't have to pay for uni. Because HEX was actually designed to make uni more accessible to everyone. Which we know sounds kind of ridiculous right now, but it's true. And even stranger, for a short while, it actually worked really well. However, like many pieces of well-intentioned policy, it's a death by a thousand little cuts. Also, by the way, yes, we now know it's technically called HELP, but just to make everyone's lives easier, we're going to keep calling it HEX. Hey, boys. Trying to talk to him all at once and it's not easy. To understand where HEX went wrong, 
we need to know where it came from. Well, Mr Hawke is now making his way, as you can see, to the front area of the tally room here in Canberra, close to the, uh, the tally board. So there. let's go back to that brief period in Australia where university was 100% free. Government House Canberra, where the Labor Party today ended more than seven years in the political wilderness. The year is 1983. Bob Hawke's Labor government has just won the election. Uh, I, Robert James Lee Hawke, do swear that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II and her heirs. I think I was just back from my gap year and starting uni. And, you know, it was a, it was a bit of a tricky time. This is Lenore Taylor, Guardian Australia's editor-in-chief. The economy was not doing great. Mr Speaker, this government inherited an economy undergoing its worst recession in 50 years. Unemployment was really high, inflation was high, but the economy was also very, very constrained, like over-regulated. But already the wheels of this Labor government were turning. Mr Hawke... They said, oh my God, the books are in terrible state. We, had, we didn't know how big the budget deficit was going to be. We are not involved in some confection or cosmetics. We are about a fundamental change in the way government operates and the way it cooperates uh, with important sectors of the Australian community. They kind of had a foot in that Reagan-Thatcher camp in that they were implementing tax cuts and they were privatising some things and deregulating some things, but they had a social contract tacked onto it. They floated the dollar, they allowed foreign banks in, they introduced superannuation, which personally I think is one of the most transformative policies that the Australian economy has ever seen. There was also this little thing called uh, Medicare. This was a softer form of neoliberalism combined with progressive social policies. Policies that were significant and expensive. We have kept tax increases to a minimum and attempted to spread rather than heighten the burden that taxation imposes. And I think it set up Australia for decades of prosperity. That pulled us out of that period of economic stagnation and God knows what would have happened to us if they hadn't done it. But as the economy begins to boom, so does something else. There are a portion of young of people who finish high school change radically. More kids were staying in high school and wanting to go to university. Which, in theory, is great. After all, uni fees had been abolished by Gough Whitlam in the 70s for exactly this reason, to get more people in the door. We will abolish fees at universities and colleges of advanced education. I mean, he'd always intended it as a equity issue, you know, to get what we now call low socioeconomic students into university. This is Julia Horn, a university historian from the University of Sydney. I benefited from that, as did a number of my friends, uh, many of whom probably wouldn't have gone because they were women and from multicultural backgrounds. You know, they've always felt very privileged that um, they doubt their parents would have paid for them to go to university. Sure, we can have education on the cheap, but our children will pay for it for the rest of their lives. And although Whitlam removed the barrier of cost, the university system back then was much smaller than it is today. And so there simply weren't enough spaces for everyone. Unfortunately, writing this ship wasn't just as easy as funding more spots. The taxpayer pays for university places 100% at that time, which meant that um, to increase the number of university places would cost taxpayers a lot of money. I remember when I edited the Queensland University student newspaper, Semper Floriat, in 1985, I actually interviewed Bob Hawke. I, I looked back at it, it wasn't possibly the most probing interview I've ever done in my life, but I did ask him four questions about tertiary fees. He said in the first instance, no, it's completely off the gender, it's never going to happen. Because it was being discussed at the time, but it wasn't policy yet. And then I said, well, what about if someone brings it up at the upcoming Federal Labor Conference? And he said, no, even if it did, it would never be policy like you just, no, 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 never, never, never. 
But that number of high school graduates just keeps going up and up. And by the time we get to 1987... That number had more than doubled. So it was well over 70%. So he had a big problem. What he confronted when they won another election, the third election when the Hawke government was 1987, was increasingly long queues of people who had done well in high school but couldn't get a university place. And so they have a dilemma. They want to get all of these kids into university, but they want to do it without raising taxes even further. A dilemma which ultimately falls at the feet of then Education Minister John Dawkins. Without John Dawkins, none of this would have happened. You can only understand Hex if you understand what the Dawkins reforms are. He was rat cunning, basically, in the way he understood and manipulated the politics. His vision was we needed a mass higher education system, which we did not yet have. Here we're having the option, or at least the offer, of major expansion in the higher education industry, if you like. That is uh, $650 million by the turn of the century is going to be ploughed back into the system. Which was underpinned by the principles of equity. People often forget that, but it's very clear in his statements. Julia says that Dawkins was essentially trying to carry forward the aims of Whitlam. In a way which will see more places for our young people and better student assistance for them. For those young people and their families who are now being denied an opportunity to get into university and college. In fact, he was actually trying to do something that Whitlam's free education policy had kind of failed to do. It wasn't so successful with the low SES groups. Or with people from rural and regional communities, or Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. Basically, it was still disproportionately wealthy and white kids who were filling those complementary and limited seats. Dawkins' solution? Size was important. You know, bigness was important. He incentivises colleges and small universities to merge with the aim of creating new universities and expanding existing ones. So how do you fund it, particularly in a period when there was um, concern in the 1980s that government should be funding less things? So how do you fund it? So that we can proceed to introduce... uh, fairly soon, a new system of funding for higher education so that we can do the things we want to do and actually the things... For this, he hires a fresh-faced economist, Bruce Chapman. When I first met him, he said something that most economists would find ridiculous. He said, we're going to put a price on university services, but we want uh, the price to be such that it doesn't affect anyone's interest in going to university. Easier said than done. (laughs) I'd only been in the office for about an hour and I thought, I wonder if it's too soon to resign. He said, the only thing you can't do is recommend against it. So here's the chalice, it's poisoned, grab it and off you go and come back and make it look a bit gentle. At first he isn't sure scrapping free education is such a good idea, but Bruce is a numbers guy. When I looked very closely at the data, it was pretty clear that it was children of advantaged and professional parents that go to university. And the numbers start to change his mind. But if it's 100% funded through taxpayers, then you're asking people, who many of whom don't even know where a university is, to contribute some part of their tax for people who come from highly advantaged backgrounds, the majority of whom went to private school. And it was, didn't take me very long at all to understand how unfair that system was. But I don't think there's anything wrong with asking people who can afford to pay to pay for something, particularly when you think that otherwise the taxpayers in general, who overwhelmingly don't get anywhere near a higher education institution, are being asked to shoulder the entire burden. It's simply unfair to leave it in that way. So Bruce comes around to the idea, but then he has to figure out what would make that system fairer. And that meant, in my mind, not charging anybody on enrolment. That was the critical point. And then, to make it really, really fair, make sure you don't charge unless people are earning okay amounts of money. The Higher Education Contribution Scheme, or HECS, was introduced in 1989. 
every student, no matter the course, paid the same amount, about $3,500 a year, adjusted for inflation. And you wouldn't pay anything until you were earning over a certain threshold, which was based on the national average wage. In current dollars, about 78000 a year. It was a landmark moment. There are many other student loan systems around the world. This was the first one, which was what we call income contingent. The government is now uh, able to break out of the fiscal straitjacket that we have been in for several years, unable to apply the necessary resources to these institutions to provide enough places. That's what it's a victory for. It was also contentious, thus the effigies and the burning. It is based on the premise that uh, we ought not require government to provide all of the funds for tertiary education. And I believe we should, and I believe government has the capacity. It's unacceptable that that sort of ideology should become part of our platform. Students didn't like it. Government is in danger of alienating not only a generation of youth, but it's also in danger of alienating most of the education community, which of course in the last 15... Not unreasonably, not surprisingly. Well, I think the reaction on campuses in particular from students and I would imagine from academics will be very swift and very severe. And, I think that over- and maybe some of their arguments were true because they were saying, you know, if, you, if this is the thin end of the wedge and, and, and if we let this through, then it will be changed in ways that will make it even harder for us. But it works. Last year we introduced the Higher Education Contribution Scheme or otherwise known as the the tertiary tax or the graduate tax. University enrolments begin to rise. Within three years, student numbers go up by 50%. The system as a whole has experienced substantial growth and full-time student numbers in particular have maintained their rapid rate of increase. Both higher degree and undergraduate numbers are up significantly. Um, and, uh... Do you personally see that as a success? I think... Undoubtedly. The way it was originally designed, I do think it was a good idea. I mean, if your aim is to open tertiary education to a whole lot more people, which I think is a good and fair outcome for society, then I think it's a reasonable policy. You know, it's enabled more Australians from diverse backgrounds than ever before. It's enabled them to study, to get a degree to, uh, you know, something that their parents did not, that their grandparents did not, that their great-grandparents did not, and in some ways changed the course of their life. And at first, it wasn't too much of a burden for graduates to pay it back. When Hex was introduced, it wasn't really introduced as a notion of a loan. So debt was never used. That's something that sort of, I've noticed, emerged um, more recently. I think the problems came when all of those levers started to be changed over time. And over the years, this system that was supposed to be based on accessibility and equity starts getting taken apart, cut by little cut. The fact that HEX has and can be politicised, depending on who's in government, creates certain problems. What what, what are you talking about? The... <laughs> Prime Minister. How would you summarise the Howard government's approach to higher education as a whole? Hmm. Disingenuous. Look, 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 can I just, can I just give you one little, a simple lesson about this government? What we brought down last night Order. was the most transparently honest budget this House has seen in years. In 1996, when John Howard said, oh my God, the Fiscal balance is in terrible shape. We've got to raise a lot of money. And in Howard's very first federal budget, the university sector gets hit hard. But I think the balance struck between increases in higher education charges were much fairer and more balanced than many people in the university sector had had expected. And he included in that close to a doubling of hex charges. They introduced a tiered system, so some degrees cost more than others. That was supposedly based on the ultimate earning capacity of people who completed those degrees. Is the Prime Minister also aware that the Vice-Chancellor of Deakin University described those decisions affecting universities as, quote, the worst news the university system in this country has ever had? Mr Speaker, I don't admit that my government has betrayed anything in relation... 
And I thought what was problematic was that the first income threshold of repayment was brought down very significantly by about 40, 45%. To around $40,000, adjusting for inflation. This means graduates are required to pay back those student loans much sooner when they have less money to spare. But, you know, having more financial stress about it. You know, when, when I went to university in 1990, you know, you had to earn a fair bit before you started paying it off. This is Greg Jericho. He's a Guardian columnist and an economist at the Australia Institute. And this is one area where, again, just like with housing, the younger generation really being screwed over. I mean, my hex debt was, to be honest, bugger all. Um, whereas now the costs are much higher and when you start repaying it off is much sooner and you really feel it because it is, it is a tax on your entire income, it's a massive impost. But the cuts keep coming. In 1999, Howard tells students they have nothing to worry about. They started out saying, no, no, we're not going to deregulate university fees. Today, the government will not be introducing an American-style higher education system. And there won't be any $100,000 university fees under this government. Mr. Speaker, that is a figment of the Labor Party's propaganda machine. And everyone knows the member that's for what it is, is Guess what happened instead? And they did pretty much all of that. In 2003, university finally meets the market. These reforms will free up universities and allow them to build on their strengths. Universities will gain access to increased Commonwealth support. They partially deregulated fees. Except for teaching and nursing, they can increase them to a maximum of 30% above HEX. It is up to the institution whether it wants to attract students and up to the student as to whether the course offers value. And how do universities respond, you might be wondering? Every university, except ANU, I might say, went straight up to the ceiling. And as a result of the changes outlined in Tuesday night's budget, students and their families, regrettably, Mr Speaker, will be forced into massive debt to obtain a university degree. Mr Speaker, how can we expect our young people to ever be able to buy a home and start a family with debts like these? And if you look at the reasons the government gives for hiking fees, it's actually a very similar argument to the one used to introduce HECS in the first place. I was standing outside the Queensland University of Technology and uh, I was waiting to go inside to the QUT. Member for and, Brisbane. Uh, the the member for Jamie me, Jamie. Uh, it's now 2005, and this is Education Minister Brendan Nelson. He had this go-to story about a run-in with an everyday person. I asked, I said, but what do you think about universities? And I don't know, really. She said, I, uh, I applied to go to one once, but I didn't get in. Uh, she said, well, could you tell them something for me? And I said, yes. And uh, she said, well... You tell them I work really hard and my taxes pay for what goes on in there. She she said, and when they come out and apply for the same job as me, they'll get the job. Slowly, university is starting to be seen as less of a necessary cost and more of a burden on the taxpayer. But these are the men and women who basically finance the $6.4 billion of public funds that will go into Australian universities this year. You're going to this university, you're going to end up earning more because you have got this higher education that we are, the taxpayers are paying for, so you're going to contribute some of the cost. Now it's becoming and shifting much more towards you having to pay more of the cost. I think the Howard years really squeezed the education sector. I think that universities had to change profoundly to cope with the funding cuts and I think the ramifications of that have, are sort of still being felt, really. But it doesn't end with Howard. We'll be right back. <laughs> 
you know, Bruce, this series is all about intergenerational inequality. Who do you think screwed millennials out of an affordable education? Oh, just for a nice, totally unemotional question. Like, who ruined the world? Because in my opinion, you're saying the world is ruined. I think the biggest problems um, are associated with pricing. So are you saying it was job-ready graduates in the Morrison government? <laughs> in a word, kind of. Yes, I am. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Morrison government understands that in this COVID crisis, we now need to pivot to a job-ready workforce with job-ready skills. In 2020, Prime Minister Scott Morrison decides to tinker with uni fees to try to direct enrolments towards areas with skill shortages. And the best way to do that is through our university sector and to encourage students to enrol in subjects with specific vocations in mind. This scheme, called Job Ready Graduates, is devastating to the arts. Where the Minister Dan Tien, he decided that it was OK to more than double the prices for humanities and to decrease the prices of what's called STEM, which is mathematics, engineering and science, to get more people to do that. So what we want to do is make sure that the prices for those degrees is cheaper so we can incentivise students to undertake those degrees because that we know that there will be jobs for them uh, when they finish their degree. So that's what we're trying to do. Suddenly, humanities students were covering almost the full cost of their education. Basically, they're sending out a message to humanities graduates that we don't think what you're studying is important which is kind of weird because half the parliamentarians are humanities graduates. So, Now, I have an arts degree. What about you, Jane? Also an arts degree. Yeah, so I'm biased here, but... Oh. I don't think it was a good no, idea. No, personally, personally, I hated it. Just from a completely objective point of view. I think it was probably one of the least well-thought-out pieces of public policy I've ever seen. And crucially, it doesn't work. <laughs> Ask yourself this question, why do people go to university to study things? Um, so, for example, if you've always loved helping pussycats and they make you the charge for being a vet 25% higher, what are you going to do? Say, oh, I don't really care about pussycats anymore. I'll just be a chartered accountant. I don't think so. Over the last... 20, 25 years since, you know, funding has really started to decline in big ways from the public purse. Between 1989 and 2017, federal funding for university research halves to 40% of their operating budgets. Why has it fallen? Why has the proportion fallen? Um, yeah, you really stumped me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think universities have been so good at kind of making do on the smell of an oily rag. This is Caitlin Cassidy, Guardian Australia's education reporter. She says that the biggest universities, the ones that are pumping out the most research, well, they need a bit more than a rag. You know, they've been able to find funds from other areas. They're targeting another group of young people we are seeing universities have to supplement their income through international students predominantly. One way that research-intensive universities could fund their research infrastructure was by increasing the number of international students and the fees they paid. Which means the fees for international students have soared beyond their domestic counterparts. Yeah, so it's way more expensive for international students to go to uni than domestic students. It differs depending on the course, but for example, a Bachelor of Science at the University of Sydney is now $50,000 a year for an international student, compared with just $10,000 a year for an Australian student. And that doesn't include things like accommodation and other medical expenses. And on top of that, they aren't eligible for HECS. I mean, international education is now Australia's fourth biggest export. It's often talked about like it's just a commodity or any other market. I mean, international students are frequently referred to as cash cows in the media. 
but it's also a lot more than that. International education can change the course of people's lives. From the 60s, there were policies developed to recognise these students who'd lived here and who had studied here at an Australian educational institution, regardless of them coming from Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, Hong Kong, wherever, would make good citizens. Then along comes John Dawkins. Remember him, the education minister who was all about equitable access to university? It turns out he had a slightly different plan when it came to international students. He starts the notion that instead of treating them like Australian students, that they might actually start paying a fee. Quite small to begin with, but that's where it sort of starts and it's certainly not small now. I just think it's uh, just the personal connection I have with that, just so you know, my father came in the 60s, so from Malaysia. In the 70s, they scraped together all the family savings they could to send my father to go to university. Um, And then, you know, because of the migration policies at the time, they were able to come back and have me. And so, I mean, I'm not the only product of that, obviously, but, you know, and then I went on to university. So when you're (laughs) saying it has a very personal resonance for me that international students form the fabric of our country's history, it's very much true for me. And it's, yeah, it makes me really sad sometimes when we see international students today as just a financial boon for the country because they are, as you say, potential future citizens. And we should be changing the narrative around that. Like, cash cow is wrong. We can acknowledge the economic benefits. I mean, Australian students bring economic benefits too. So regardless of where you come from, you know, we can't see being a student being a burden. And we also can't see a student being a cash cow to, you know, it's, it's not a useful conversation. So when you use the term cash cows, here we go, ka-ching, ka-ching, all right? Manarani Guy is the president of VicWise, which supports international students to try to find jobs in Australia. That's not the reason why we brought them. You mentioned the term cash cow before. How do you feel about that term? I would rephrase that question and I I would say, how do the students feel about this term? They, they, They are very, very angry. They're very upset because they have paid big money to come here. She says that not all international students are, quote, filthy rich. There is massive inequality within the international student sector. I have students who are couch surfing, bed hopping, Then on the other end, I've got students who've got $3 million and their parents can buy an apartment for them to live in, in the city. And they don't need to blink an eyelid. And there's no one size fits all. I guess the argument is, you know, international students come to Australia to gain a world-class education, to, um, you know, gain great experience, great skills. But all of this is becoming increasingly difficult to pay for, particularly for those coming from developing countries. So parents have mortgaged their properties, mothers have mortgaged their jewellery. They pump money into their child's education and that is their investment. They've got this enormous financial stress, that's burden that they're carrying before they land here. And all the things we've been saying young people have been facing, insecure work, soaring rents, high inflation, they're all hitting international students too. We are supposed to be a country that has got quality education. We are supposed to be compassionate. We are supposed to be kind. We are supposed to be understanding. We do not use them to fill up our coffers. I know everyone has a business. I know everyone has to make money. But to what extent do you make money out of the sector? They are human beings, they are young kids. It's just so expensive, Matilda. I just can't imagine my dad's family having enough money to send him to university under today's conditions. Yeah. I mean, like, it's genuinely at a point where you're kind of screwed if you're a domestic student, potentially even more screwed if you're an international student, and then all of this is starting to have very real consequences. Many today are saying that their hex debt 
has a substantial negative impact on their ability to get a home loan or save for a deposit, what, what would you say to them? Anything that cuts a graduate's income, their real disposable income, will have some effect on their capacity to borrow. What are you going to do about it? Do you want to get rid of HEX? Do you have any sympathy for students today who are dealing with the sorts of conditions we're talking about? Or do you feel like the answer to these worries lies somewhere outside of the HEX system and, and outside of education? Well, you've got to be sympathetic to people for all kinds of reasons they've got no control over. But the whole concept of intergenerational equity is a complicated one. So you can point to things and say, oh, you've got a hex debt, your mother and your father or your grandfather didn't have that, that's unfair. Well, yes, but the price of medicine is very, very different from what it used to be. Yes. The access to good, great surgery is very, very different. And people say to me, oh, but when you are a student, you didn't pay fees and it's really unfair that we have to now. But here's the fact, somebody is 20 years old now, will have, in real per capita terms, more than double the income of people 40 years ago. And you can manifest it in ways that you don't obviously n notice. Like, do you know a 20-year-old who doesn't own a car? I don't. But when you look at the numbers, more young people are starting to wonder if they can even afford to go to uni in the first place. So people straight out of high school going to university, there's been a bit of a drop off there. So taking the Pulse of the Nation report released in late October found those financial barriers were the greatest abstraction to young Australians pursuing higher education. 60% of respondents said expensive tuition fees were deterring people from university study, followed by doubts university led to a better job and reluctance to take on student loans. So just over half were worried about taking on a big amount of debt. It makes sense, especially given HEX is tied to the rate of inflation, which I don't know if you've noticed, but seems to be really high lately. Indexation day last year was pretty brutal on my bank account. And it's even going to get worse. The number of students going to uni is likely only going to drop further because high school graduation rates are also going down, making the pipeline to university smaller. So while HEC succeeded in getting so many more of us into university, we're still facing the same inequalities around who is going. The expansion has largely come still from the middle class. The three big groups that are still not going to university in terms of their proportion within the general population are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, low SES and rural, regional, remote. We've got a lot more people coming from poorer backgrounds than we ever had before. But even when you've got a really big system, our system, you know, as I said, is three times bigger, you'll still have disparities which come really from factors beyond the control of what you can do with universities. If HEX was working properly, then there would be no barrier to university and we would see a much more equitable cohort of students going through universities. We should be asking of a 30-year-old policy, is it still fit for purpose? So, Jane, is HEX inadvertently screwing young people out of an affordable education? HEX in principle, no. But as it stands today, there are specific financial stresses that are affecting young people regardless of their social class. And HEX does not accommodate for that. As Julia says, financial stresses like skyrocketing rents were just not an issue for young people when HEX was established. You know, it was not devised in a period when those things were even considered, I think. So maybe HEX needs to change with the times. There is change somewhere out there on the horizon. On the weekend, I released the Universities Accord, and that's a blueprint for how we reform higher education in this country for the next decade and the decade after that. The Universities Accord has been a long time coming. 
Because the Albanese government commissioned this massive report called the Australian University Accord, and 12 mammoth months of work later, it's finally here. This report is jam-packed full of reforms to tackle this and other challenges, including things like fee-free university places. And this report points out everything we've been talking about. The report acknowledges that our current system has failed and we need some serious reform if we're to keep up on a global scale and to drive innovation in Australia. And specifically, when it comes to HEX. Found it's an indispensable part of higher education funding, but it needs reform to retain its social licence. This report reinforces the mission that both Dawkins and Whitlam before him had. It highlights the need to get more Australians into higher education. And to do that, the focus is once again on equity. And it also says that we've got to break down that invisible barrier that stops a lot of young people from the outer suburbs and from the regions from getting a crack at university in the first place and succeeding when they get there. So that means we need to more than double the number of domestic students to 1.8 million in those intervening years. We're not going to be able to get there unless disadvantaged cohorts of Australians are going to university and to vet in larger numbers. There are a lot of recommendations, 47 of them, all aimed at getting even more Australians into higher education by 2050. I mean, they're talking about 80% of Australian adults. Just to ensure that we'll be qualified for the jobs of the future. I'm really happy, actually, with what the Accords come up with. And P.S. Uh, Bruce is one of the people involved in that whole Accord process. This was the biggest opportunity in 35 years, in my view, to do radical things. And in his eyes, the recommendation to scrap Morrison's job ready graduates is the biggest of them all. But the question that was basically being fleshed out in the final report was what are we going to replace it with? And so if you said to me, what is the single most important thing that this accord process could come up with, I would say to recommend and to suggest that the most important determinant of the setting of prices is expected future income. That's what they've done. The final report has recommended a contribution system that's instead based upon future earnings. So, for instance, if I'm studying medicine, my degree might be a little bit more expensive because I'm likely to make quite high wages once I graduate. Concurrently, for um, jobs like teaching and nursing, your degree might be cheaper because your lower lifetime wages are going to be kind of more stagnant and you're also making a significant public contribution. We want the charge to reflect not where your parents are coming from, but where you're going to. Well, I'm, ha I'm very pleased that's there, yeah. And while the report obviously has a whole bunch of other recommendations which aim to make university more equitable and accessible for everyone, there is one group of people missing. The elephant in the room was international students. The report made very few mentions to a sector that, you know, contributes a huge amount to our economy, but also our universities now are composed of about a third of international students, so it's really significant. In terms of actual recommendations, it kind of noted that um, we need to make sure that international students are having a good experience when they're at university. You know, they, they bring so much value to our university sector, but it didn't actually say anything concrete and it didn't say, you know, how the system is going to remain viable. But Bruce thinks we need to focus on the future of domestic Australian students. When we think about equity in a domestic political economy context, we're not talking about world equity. We're talking about equity for Australian taxpayers, equity for Australian students. But whatever happens, international students and the fees they pay are a vital part of this system. So when making a fairer and more equitable one, we can't ignore how dependent universities have become on students from overseas. I think across parties, there is a really clear understanding that we need an educated population to be competitive economically. 
I think there is differences in terms of how we get there. And we are now in a situation with university funding where universities are so very dependent on export education and where they have been underfunded for a long time that it's going to be hard to sort of rebuild a system that is fit for purpose for what the country needs. It's a really positive time in that higher education is actually on the agenda. The costs of higher education is on the agenda and equity is kind of at the, at the focal point of all of this, but we haven't seen much in the way of action yet. But what's the point of all this education if it doesn't buy you a secure job? Many young people are stuck in insecure work today, in a war between employers and unions that's been raging for decades. I'm not from some, you know, wealthy background and silk purses and all the rest of it at all. And I hated the prospect of of firing all these people. But, you know, honestly, it was something that had to be done. Yeah, like the the reality, I think, is pretty dire for people of our generation um, and, and younger. Like that deregulation of the labour market for us is is hurting pretty badly. And right now, employers definitely have the upper hand. More and more workers are, you know, left to bargain one-on-one against their boss rather than to have a union to do that for them and to have the, the threat of collectively withdrawing their labour by going on strike. And as a result, people get paid a lot less. So who screwed millennials out of secure work? That's next time. This episode was presented by me, Matilda Bosley. And me, Jane Lee. I also reported this episode with Michelle Macklem and Joe Coning. Michelle and Joe were also the producers on this episode. Additional production by Karish Maluthria and Nick McCorriston. Sound design by Joe Coning. Mixing by Michelle Macklem. The series producer is Miles Herbert. Thanks to Malcolm Farnsworth and AustralianPolitics.com for helping source some of the archive for this episode. Our executive producer is Miles Martignoni and commissioning editor is Gabrielle Jackson. Find out who screwed millennials by subscribing to Full Story wherever you get your podcasts. The series will be in your feeds from March 25th. 